So the world's empty office buildings have become a ticking debt time bomb. Between the record high vacancies here in the United States of 20% and climbing in metro office space, to the rising interest rates, which are making it increasingly harder for companies to refinance their debt, to the falling asset values of commercial real estate, which make it even harder to borrow against. Couple that with tightening lending standards and low liquidity in borrowing and lending markets, and you've got yourself a toxic combination that threatens to hurt anybody with exposure, not just to the $20 trillion US commercial real estate market, but to the $34 trillion global commercial real estate market. So let's talk about why it's becoming increasingly difficult for offices to actually pay their mortgages and the risks associated with everybody that is exposed to this type of lending and the securitized assets that come from it. Up next. So first things first, let's talk about why it's becoming so difficult for office spaces to pay off their mortgages. Take a look at this graphic right here in the left side of my head. This is the office avail availability rate in select US downtown areas. You can see right down there, Boston is the lowest at 17.4%, all the way up to the very alarmingly high availability of office space in San Francisco, no surprise, at 32.7%. If you average all these out, it's roughly 20 to even 25% vacancy of US office space, which is pretty bad if you consider that the lion's share of office space is rented and the lion's share of office space also has a mortgage tied to it. And of course, you need cash flows, you need revenue in order to pay down those mortgages. And if you have 20% vacancy, that means there is no cash flow to pay off that mortgage. And that's become a pretty huge issue. Um, of the $1.5 trillion worth of total commercial real estate debt set to mature this year, 61% of office loans are already delinquent. Take a look at this chart right here. Uh, this is a graph of loans paid through April, right? So all the way through uh, up through Q1 and then the month of April as well. Um, and this is whether loans were paid off during the period or they were in default. So the maturity default, i.e. they were pushed back to a later date, right? So they're not paid and they were restructured so that they were pushed back to a later date when they could be paid. 61% of these loans haven't been paid, right? So 61% of office loans in the United States are delinquent, um, either being moved into default or the maturity of it being pushed back. That's quite disconcerting, right? Because I just said that there's $1.5 trillion in total uh, U.S. commercial real estate debt that's maturing this year and next year, right? And we're just talking about the U.S. commercial real estate market, but this issue is global. This is not just an issue that happens in the U.S., although I am using United States data to make my case. So record high vacancies, right? And that's making it very difficult for these entities to pay off their debt. Um, of course, higher interest rates are also a very, very huge issue. Of course, right now, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage for a uh, United States residential consumer is roughly 7.1%. Uh, and so corporate borrowers, right? You know, people who want to open up office space, they're having to borrow and take out a mortgage at a spread. Chances are at a spread to that, right? They're going to have to be borrowing at six, seven, maybe 8% for the duration of their mortgage. And that's just not good. And so obviously you're seeing a slowdown in commercial lending as a result of this. You're seeing a slowdown in office lending as a result of this. People can't take on new debt and it's becoming harder for them to refinance debt. And so they're either not paying or they're entering into a formal default. And we're seeing that all across commercial real estate. So the lenders of these buildings, they have to mark down the value of their assets. They're no longer t uh, extending as many loans. They're tightening up standards. Um, and also uh, a great deal of the people that they have loans extended to and they're expecting cash flows from simply are not paying. And who are the types of banks that have the highest amount of commercial real estate concentration? It's small banks, right? These smaller banks, um, these these banks have asset sizes between 10 and $100 billion, right? Again, they're not your JP Morgan's. Um, and, and even smaller than those small banks are community banks. So small and community banks make up the lion's share of lending for commercial real estate mortgages. They make up 70% of outstanding office loans. That's a very, very high portion. They have a very high concentration within commercial real estate. Um, so not only are they lending to commercial real estate uh, developers for these mortgages, but they're also packaged into mortgage-backed securities. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Essentially, this is a method for banks to fund themselves, right? They want to extend 
extend mortgages, but they want the cash flow from the mortgage right up front. They don't want to extend the mortgage and then have that on their balance sheet for 15, 30 years. They want to extend a mortgage and then package it, all of those cash flows included, into a fixed income instrument like a bond that pays periodically, right? Monthly uh, in the, or, or quarterly or semi-annually or annually. And they sell it to an investor who's looking for a fixed income instrument. And then that gets treated like a U.S. Treasury or some other type of corporate bond. So that's what banks do, right? And oftentimes, banks are packaging these and something, and they're selling them, and oftentimes they're selling them to other banks. So not only do small banks have exposure to commercial real estate and office space, particularly from lending to those developers, but they also have it because they buy these commercial mortgage-backed securities from other small banks. And so the two types of assets that a bank can have, its loan book and its securities, both of those are now comprised of office space of commercial real estate debt in an ever increasing quantity as an ever increasing portion of their uh, risk weighted capital. So take a look at this. This is commercial real estate concentration ratios by bank size. And if you'll notice at the very bottom, I highlighted this in yellow, 763 banks out of the 4,756 4, surveyed or roughly one in six banks has a commercial real estate concentration of over 300%. That is the same I'll tell you, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, and again, what this means essentially is that of the assets that are on their books, right, again, between $10 billion and $100 billion, these are small banks, um, that they have commercial real estate concentration in the form of loans and assets that are over 300% of their total assets. Not good, right? That is an extremely high concentration to commercial real estate, which makes you especially susceptible to losses on those assets. And one particularly interesting thing and a very eerie echo to the great financial crisis, that is the same concentration that small banks had to commercial real estate in the lead up to the 2008 financial crisis. This is a report in Q3 2006, and you'll note at the bottom, it says CRE concentration levels at commercial and savings banks with assets between 100 million and 1 billion, small banks, have doubled from approximately 156% of total risk-based capital in 1993 to 318% in third quarter 2006. Okay. So that is an immense increase in the amount of commercial real estate exposure relative to total risk-based capital. Um, of course, capital that ends up being allocated to both assets and security, uh, excuse me, securities and loans by banks. And right now we're experiencing that same level of concentration. That makes particularly smaller banks who make up a lion's share of this lending and have a lion's share of this exposure extremely susceptible to losses on those assets because it is over 300% of the amount of assets that they actually have in their books that they could then sell to recoup those losses. For example, I'll give you a few names. PacWest, which is a name that's been in the news, is a 328% commercial real estate concentration ratio. Valley National has 423% real estate concentration ratio. These are especially uh, exposed banks to commercial real estate, which, as I just mentioned, is facing a variety of factors, higher interest rates, um, and of course, this record high vacancy that is making it so revenues are drying up, chances are they're going to default. And when they default, the people who hold these loans are going to, uh, they're going to suffer and they're going to suffer bad because those are cash flows that are expected. And they may be even taking the expectation of those cash flows and borrowing against them somewhere else, which could set off a huge daisy chain of defaults and delinquencies. Um, but of course, that makes PacWest, Valley National, other banks that have these high, high CRE concentration ratios, especially susceptible to failure and then mergers and, and acquisitions and things of that sort. So as you guys know, here at the Bitcoin layer, Nick and I are huge advocates of self-custody. And as of right now, one of the largest crypto custodians in the Western Hemisphere, Prime Trust, is potentially filing for bankruptcy and potentially, reportedly, being ordered a cease and desist order by Nevada state regulators. Ultimately, your Bitcoin is not your Bitcoin unless you're holding it in cold storage. And that's where Envoy comes in. Envoy is a simple and easy to use Bitcoin mobile wallet. It's a Bitcoin mobile hot wallet. It's free to download, takes 60 seconds to set up, and you can take your Bitcoin off exchanges with ease. If, guys, if you've been putting this off for any amount of time, I'm telling you, this is the solution for you. Most of my relatives, most of the people that I've put on Bitcoin are usually very, very averse to things like this, but several of my relatives, I've referred this to you, my dad, my mom, my brother, they've been able to download this, set it up very easily, take their Bitcoin off exchange, and have peace of mind. If you want that same peace of mind too, go to the App Store or the Google Play Store and download Envoy for free. That's Envoy, E-N-V-O-Y. Download it today for free. And now back to the video. So of course, 
Jerome Powell, he's noticed this. He noticed this and he, he noted it yesterday after a question came through to him while he was on Capitol Hill. He's been on Capitol Hill for the last two days. Um, and he basically advised small banks to sell your commercial real estate exposure. Get rid of it as fast as you can and do it in a way that doesn't alarm other people, right? Do it in a way that doesn't get out and spark more bank runs like what happened in March. He said he's closely monitoring a few, a few of these banks that have dangerously high commercial real estate concentration. He said, and I quote, and we won't have this up on the screen, but I'll, I'll read it verbatim to you. He said, the Fed is actively engaging with institutions exhibiting high concentration in commercial real estate loans, urging them to take necessary steps such as increased capital requirements to mitigate potential loss risks. Oh boy. So just like I mentioned, they have over 300% of their risk-based capital allocated uh, or exposed rather to commercial real estate. And he is saying, accumulate other assets, right? Sell off this commercial real estate, uh, get more capital on your books so that you're shielded should you experience tremendous losses on these assets, which by all accounts with these record high vacancies and 61% of office debt, debt that was supposed to mature this year now overdue, chances are those losses will be coming and they will be coming in short order. So what is the outcome of all of this, right? Ultimately, what happens? Well, of course, the people who hold these assets are going to suffer immensely. Um, but these banks, right, ultimately, some of them are going to fail. Some of them are going to be purchased by other banks. There's going to be mergers. There are going to be roll-ups. And Janet Yellen has said as much. She said that more bank mergers and obviously failures, right? Why would a bank be purchased if it was not on the brink of failure are likely this year and earnings are coming up in July. And so Janet Yellen said due to weak earnings, weak earnings, obviously not addressing the commercial real estate elephant in the room, um, you know, they're going to be bought out. They're going to be merged with other banks. She also cited higher deposit rates, which also leaves a dent in bank profitability. Of course, banks borrow short in the form of de deposits and they lend along, right, in the form of the assets that they purchase. Um, and of course, one of those assets, uh, some of those assets oftentimes being commercial mortgage-backed securities they buy from other banks. Um, but if when they're borrowing short, those interest rates that they have to pay are much higher, which let's take a look at front-end rates. Uh, bills right now are yielding something like what, 5, 525, 5.5%. That's insane. Banks have to compete with that. When over the last 14 years, they've only had to pay out 0.25%. Throws a huge wrench in bank funding, and this will kill a lot of the banks that are already suffering on the asset side of their balance sheet from the toxic commercial real estate exposure that they have, and will get worse and will cause them to incur even more losses as more office, develop, more office space defaults down the line. Here's a direct quote from Janet Yellen. There may be some problems from this, but I think it's going to be manageable. I don't really think that this is systemic. Well, we all know Janet Yellen's track record and Jerome Powell's track record of saying that this won't be a problem. Don't worry. It's not going to be systemic, blah, blah, blah. But I think I've made a robust enough case that chances are this will be systemic, particularly for those smaller banks. And again, I alluded to if these institutions are expecting cash flows from this, uh, from this, from uh, these office mortgages that they've written, um, and they're using that expectation of cash flows to go and borrow against it elsewhere, then if that gets defaulted on, they're going to have to default on who they are borrowing from. Do you, do you catch my drift here? So this could create a huge daisy chain of dominoes. Of course, that's conjecture, but the risks are there. And ultimately, there's no backstop for commercial real estate losses. This is the huge rub. The people who have exposure to this right now, there isn't an emergency facility for them to be saved by someone like the central bank. The Fed created an emergency facility with the bank term funding program of course, to mitigate losses on U.S. Treasury securities. That became a huge issue last September with the Bank of England when pension funds, you know, basically were, were at the brink of insolvency as a result of mark-to-market losses on U.S. Treasuries, uh, excuse me, on their U.K. gilts, their U.K. government bonds. And the Bank of England had to step in with an emergency bond buying program to prop that up and make sure that these institutions uh, that were leveraged off of uh, their U.K. bonds didn't fail. And the United States had to do something very similar this March uh, when the value of U.S. Treasuries over the last 18 months has fallen by so much that it threatened uh, institutions that were borrowing against their treasuries. Um, and the unfortunate thing is there isn't a facility like this for commercial real estate losses, right? Is the Fed going to create an emergency facility to buy distressed commercial real estate and buy distressed commercial mortgage-backed securities? Who knows? Right? At this point, we don't know, but it might be a solution that the Fed explores to stave off this problem. Because like I mentioned, there is uh, the U.S. commercial real estate market is twenty trillion dollars in size, okay, and there is roughly three trillion dollars in U.S. commercial real estate debt. One point four over one point four trillion of that is maturing this year and next. And like I said, if that trend continues of delinquency, 
then you're looking at more than half, maybe even two thirds of those payments being pushed out into the future or even defaulted on, right? 61% is already delinquent, and that's a very disconcerting trend considering the size of the of the total US commercial real estate market, the amount of debt that there is in it, and the basically more than half of that debt that is maturing this year and next. Not to mention that this is a global problem, right? This isn't a problem that the Fed can totally band-aid over. It may be able to create emergency facilities to help with this particular commercial real estate problem in the US, but what on planet Earth is it gonna do with the UK, with Germany, with Hong Kong, with China? places that are experiencing these exact same problems of the remote work, creating all these vacancies, and now how on earth are these mortgages gonna be paid off, right? Of course you can convert it into residential space. That's gonna take years, right? And those are years that these lenders simply don't have because they're expecting these cash flows. Now the bank term funding program, I'll leave you with this, right? The bank term fund funding program, this emergency liquidity facility currently is $102 billion in loans outstanding. Um, now, of course, this staves off credit destruction. Um, because it it generates more risk taking in markets more broadly. Basically, these these banks have huge losses in their U.S. Treasuries, and they don't have to stomach them. They're, they don't have to sell them. Instead of having to sell them at a steep discount, they can park them with the Fed and uh, and earn a rate of return on them. Right with this BTFP facility. And so whereas the banks would be backing away from credit creation, now they don't have to. And so it, it's basically propped up risk taking and kicked the inevitable can down the road where credit credit creation is going to slow down by a tremendous amount. And so as the BTFP has risen, take a look at this chart right here, the S&P 500 has risen alongside it. This is the bank term funding program rate, which as it rises, that means it's becoming more expensive to borrow. More people are using BTFP. So as the usage of this emergency loan facility rises, the S&P 500 rises too. And so obviously this isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. I'm telling you that what the Fed is doing here is they're kicking the can down the road and allowing, allowing risk-taking to proliferate. And so this is essentially a form, a way to put it, of shadow liquidity. Um, you know, that's a way that Michael Howell has referenced it. And I think it's extremely apt here. So imagine the addition. So this is this is causing risk markets to take off, right? This is this is basically not QE QE, right? It's it's they're not buying distressed assets from banks, but they're allowing them to park them with the Fed, and you know they can receive par in return. And it, it's a loan you got to pay us back, but for the time being, the party goes on. This is a form of shadow liquidity. Now imagine the additional shadow liquidity if the Fed were to create an emergency commercial real estate liquidity facility. If they were to buy. Or, you know, create a facility where you can loan us your mortgages, et cetera, et cetera, and we can give you that distressed asset back at par value. Imagine with the $1.5 trillion in commercial real estate loans that are maturing this year and next, if the Fed created an emergency facility where they either buy outright or they lend against that debt and give borrowers and owners of those assets par value in return. That's a lot of liquidity, folks. And that's a lot of liquidity that, of course, as per usual, comes from nowhere. So that's the end of the video for today. I really appreciate you guys watching. Make sure if you're following, if you're watching this on Twitter, make sure to follow. If you're watching it on YouTube, make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell so you always know when we upload next. And that's it for today. Take care. So thanks for sticking around to the end of the video, everybody. Of course, none of this would be possible without our generous sponsors over at Foundation Devices. Today, we're talking about Passport. You guys have heard us talk about this in the past. And let me tell you, this is a device that I use very frequently. In my purview, it is the easiest to use Bitcoin hardware wallet, right? You can give this to anybody who doesn't know how to use, uh, you know, very nitty gritty, very specific and technically savvy devices, and they will immediately know how to use it. It looks just like one of those old Nokia phones that everybody is familiar with. It has a directional pad, it has a keypad, so you can very easily take your Bitcoin off of exchanges or off of a hot wallet, put it into cold storage, and then have the peace of mind that comes with that. And as of right now, for a limited time, if you use code Bitcoin Layer, you can get ten dollars off the purchase of a passport. Just go to the bitcoinlayer.com slash foundation or Google passport by foundation devices and you'll be able to find what you are looking for. Again, thanks so much for staying to the end of the video. That's all. Talk to you soon.